thrilled that you're here and we want to welcome our online listeners and our community of uh, guests. And tonight we're going to talk about great power of small things. Y'all say that with me, great power, great power. of small things. So we're not going to finish tonight, but we'll get, but we'll get started. I uh, got a few comments, then uh, we'll, uh, I'm going to give you some uh, scriptures um, that, you can, that you can look up. I think it'll, it'll help us to go back. It always helps to go back and look at the scriptures. I mean, uh, I know I've done this before myself, you know, way before I was in the ministry, even in being in meetings now. Uh, you can go and you can jot down all kinds of scriptures, and you might mean to go back, but somehow, sometimes it, sometimes it doesn't always happen. No one has to raise their hand or say amen. But anyway, I know how that can work. But it's just it's something about the repetitiveness of, of, of hearing something and then seeing it with your own eyes and then speaking it out that, that gives us mastery over it. So I'm going to say it this way. Everything in the world, everything in the universe begins with and revolves around two things. So you see it's already going to be simple. So we're really going to talk about just two things. So everything in this universe works, revolves, begins with, and uh, has their going in two things. And that's number one. Words and number two, thoughts. Words and thoughts. Now, you, there's, when I say that, you say, well, I know all about this. Well, go ahead, you, you teach then. I'll be sitting. <laughs> well, I, I haven't learned it all. I'm, 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 I, know, I know a few things, as we all do, but we certainly want to get mastery of it. So these two elements form the creative substance that molds and shapes the, the destiny of humanity and of your life and of your future. And it could be said this way, that whatever you harbor in your innermost corridor of your thought life, sooner or later will be revealed in the outer arena, or arena of uh, your words and action. In other words, whatever we think about long enough, we'll talk about. Jesus says, you know, whatever, whatever's in your heart will eventually come out your lips. And that's just the way that it absolutely works all the time. You might can withhold some things. You might can train yourself. Uh, at times, sometimes people come to a church, and they come to a church like this where there is teaching on, on the power of the spoken word. And sometimes people have been trained to do it for an hour or two they want to go to church. But on the way to church and the way after church, somehow the lesson's over. And it's no longer about life. It's, it, it was just about that service. Well, we want to become masters of this. And we'll, and we'll talk about the why of it and how important that is for us individually. But I'll give you this, uh, this verse here, and this is the B part. This is the ESV translation. This is 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, the B part. It says, God will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Read it one more time. God's going to bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and he will disclose the purposes of the heart. I have another way I can say that. It's called seed time and harvest time. Seed time and harvest time. Just as in every seed, there is a life. In, uh, to my seeds, whether it's agriculture, flowers, whatever it is, just as in every seed, there is life. And there's life-giving power that resides in every spoken word. How many know the word of God, the Bible says, is life? Not has life, it is life. The word of God is life. And uh, so uh, just as a seed is for a time hidden, when you plant it into the ground, you can't see it. You put it in the dirt, you put it in the soil, you cover it up, you water it, you do what you do. Everything that you did was hidden. But the time will come and it will reveal itself and uh, that, that seed will become a harvest. And, and, and eventually it will break through in the essence uh, it, or its, it's, its actual essence will be revealed. You'll, you'll know what it is. I think Sandra Womack said it this way. He said, I don't have to be there when you plant the garden to know what you planted because I can just wait a few weeks dry by and I'll know what you planted. Well, that's because every seed will have a harvest, and the fruit will determine, the fruit will tell us what the seed was. Is that right? So here's a quote for you, if you want, uh, and this is just something the way, I, the way I put it. Uh, all that you are and all that you experience and ultimately achieve can be traced back to how you make use of these two simple things, which, which is your thoughts and your words. And they're, they may be simple, but they're vastly powerful tools. Your thoughts and your words, everything you experience in life, will be traced back to in your life to these two powerful tools and how you make use of them. And that's why in Proverbs, you know, a scripture that we know very well, says as a person, as a man or a woman, whatever it is, uh, as, as they think in their heart, that's who they are. That's a scripture that, 
that uh, is easy to memorize. We know it, but I wonder if we understand the weight of that scripture that as, as the, we think in our heart, that's actually who we are, who we've become. That is profoundly, profoundly weighty when you think about it. And Proverbs 4 and 23 in the New Living Translation says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Think about that. Proverbs says, Guard your heart above all else, your heart, for it determines the course of your life. Now, that's pretty powerful if you believe the Bible. Well, you think so? I mean, if the, if the Bible is the, is the Word of God and the final Word, then that's pretty powerful. That he, he would tell you that it's, it's imperative that you guard your heart because above everything else, it will determine the course of your life. And then Jesus followed suit along that same line with saying this in Mark, or um, excuse me, Matthew 12, verses 34 and, th and 35, and this is in the New Living also. It says, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil man produces evil things of an evil heart. So whatever's in your heart will become eventually what you'll say. And what you say is what you'll have, right? What occupies your mind determines what eventually will fill your mouth. So <clears throat> it's, uh, you can call it uh, seed time, harvest time, the law of sowing and reaping. That's a law of sowing and reaping. It's also the law of cause and effect. Both of them are at work. Sowing and reaping is always at work. Cause and effect is always at work. They're actually spiritual laws, so they're always working. Now, here, here's a verse that uh, many of you may, may all know about it, but seldom is it ever spoken about. Um, I hear very little reference to it, but it's in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, and it says, For they that sow the wind shall reap the whirlwind. They that are sowing the wind is going to reap the whirlwind. Well, there's the sowing and reaping principle. There's the cause and the effect principle once again. So the two main things that we talk about tonight is, is words and thoughts, thoughts and words. And when you have control over these things and you have mastery of these things, the Bible promises you a very successful life. Thank you. It, it didn't have anything to do with age, where you was born, to whom you was born to, your education or lack thereof, whether you was, had... Uh, the, you know, the social graces, or you didn't have them. You know, you just, you woke up, you was a country boy and girl. That's, it, it didn't, those aren't factors to anything. But it's a matter of what are you going to do with words and what are you going to do with the thoughts? Because all of us have thoughts. Actually, we have thousands of them every day. I don't know what the truth is. I mean, I've looked these things up for years, and, 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 and they'll say uh, the least that I've ever saw is like 20,000. Most I've ever thought, they said in the daytime, we can have up to 70,000 thoughts. But even if it's 20,000, that's a lot of thinking going on. When you think 20,000, not 20 thoughts, 20,000. And you might disagree with that, but see, these thoughts maybe just come just as impressions. There's a lot of things that go through our mind all the time that we wouldn't stop and say, well, this is a thought, and that's a thought, and this is a thought, and that's a thought. It's like when you get up in the morning, you know, and it takes a while. So some of you, you know, we need a jump start. And I don't know if that means coffee or tea or whatever it is that you need. And some people just get bouncing out of bed and they're springing up. Most people don't like those people. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, especially if you live with one of them. And then, you know, they just go like, it's morning, let's go. And they're like, you know, like, uh, I, got soldier, I got soldiers in my cup. I mean, Folgers. <laughs> and it takes two or three of those, you know, to figure out what day of the week that it is. Well, you know, so for a while, you know, you, they're just kind of sitting there, just kind of gradually waking up, you know, just kind of gradually waking up. And then you look over and say, what do you think about it? And they'll say, what? Nothing. Well, that's not really true. And then and it's like, well, I don't know what I'm thinking about. Well, that means they really don't know and they need help or they're just not going to tell you. I don't know which one it is. But anyway, but so, so sometimes it takes a while. But even while it's taking a while, you're just processing yesterday, uh, that morning, what you got to do that day, all the things. That's, so all these, you may not count them as thoughts, but they're all thoughts. The mind's never just neutral. Even when you're asleep, it's not neutral. Anyone ever dream? Something's going on all the time. So maybe, how many of you ever had some active dreams, so active it woke you up? And, you know, sometimes they can be fun, sometimes they can not be so fun. You ever try to outrun a snake in your in your dreams? Is it... If I, don't, I don't know why it is, and maybe, maybe y'all aren't like me, but it, every time I've tried to get away from snakes, it's like I'm swimming in peanut butter. 
you know, <laughs> crunchy peanut butter. And I can't seem to get out of it. You know, it's just, the, you know, just, it's like being in quicksand. And, uh, and it didn't, doesn't bother the snake at all. He's just advancing, and I'm just like there. And then finally, when he goes to for the ha, ah, and I'll jerk, and then I'll wake up and, think, and glad that I'm up. And uh, so our, our mind, our subconscious mind, it's active all the time. And so it's it paramount that we master our thoughts. You could say it this way, that uh, your outward is a direct result of your inward. Your outward is a direct result of your inner world. So every circumstance in life is a result of a choice. True? Every circumstance in life is a result of someone's choice. And every choice is a result of, of a thought. You and I both, we all provide the fuel for your words. And because we provide the fuel for our words, we provide the fuel for our world, LD. We provide the fuel for our words, which provides the fuel for your world. So it's paramount that, that we master our thoughts. In other words, you, another way of saying that is, we all, since we're all going to have thoughts, then what do we do with them? Well, you could say it this way, that you need to sift your thought life. You need to filter it. And if you're like most of us, maybe you're not, but I think that you are. I know I think I preached on this years ago and had this analogy of a, a military term that every sovereign nation has that we, that we, that we need to have a no-fly zone because the enemy do, does not respect your borders. He just, he just does it. I mean, he, he, he just thinks, you know, your, your space is his space. Your life is his life. So you have to sift your thought life and you have to filter out everything that you don't want to show up in your future. If you don't want to see it in your future, you have to get rid of your thought life. Most people don't get involved until it's already in, in their natural life, and then they're dealing with the, they're they're dealing on with a a, a, a head-on confrontation. But if generally, not always, but generally, we all have time before we, we see it in its present day state. And it was it began as a thought, it be, it began as a seed. There's very few people in prison who just woke up and said, "Let's just go rob a bank." That'd be their first thought, and they've never done anything like that. I mean, they got a behavior, and they're the valedictorian, and they just wake up and say, let's go rob Regents, and it's like, all right, let's go. That, that, that probably, it may have happened, but I, I think it, you'd be hard-pressed to find it. These were thoughts and thoughts and thoughts, and probably people with the wrong kind of company, and they're all, <laughs> they're all talking about crazy stuff together, then one day, maybe three years later, say, so, you know, but if we could do that and get away with it, well, every, so, you know, I don't know this for sure, but, I mean, they say that everyone who's in prison, is they all say they're not guilty. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm sure, I'm sure that's, uh, there's some measure of that going on everywhere. Well, it, it is. It's just we all have a thought life, and it may not take you to the place to where your thoughts take you to a physical prison, but you can be in prison and be call free. I mean, you, you can look like you're, you're free to come and do, but you can still be in prison. Right? In, in, in your heart and in your mind and in your emotion, be in prison. And Jesus paid the price to set you free. And Jesus said that if, if you'll accept the truth, the truth will make you, it'll make you free. But if, but if, you, but if you embrace a lie, you can't, you can't live in freedom living in hypocrisy or lies. It, it's just it's absolutely impossible to do that. So we have to filter out to sift our, sift our thought life or create that no-fly zone so when something comes down, I mean, you just have to pull out whatever the weapon is and boom, and you have to shoot down. It's not physical weapons, but we have to get rid of these, you know, like Brother Hagin used to say, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head. He said, you have no control about birds flying over your head. He said, but you do have control whether or not they're going to build a nest in your hair. You do not have to, you know, you don't have to be a, a, a tree and say, this is a good place for you to land and build a, a nest. No, we don't have to do that. So what are we going to do? Well, we should focus on the truth, and we should focus on what we truly desire. All these one-liners that I'm giving you, they all could be expounded on uh, a whole lot. In other words, focus on what you truly desire. That could be a series. For me, for me, it could be. Focus on what you desire. What is it that you're desiring? Well, usually what you're desiring is encumbered by all the things that you don't desire. When you read the parable of the sower, the, I mean, the, the seed goes in, but we know that only one out of four you know, really gets a harvest. And then only one out of those four receive a hundredfold. 
But the potential is that there will be a harvest of a hundredfold for all of us. It is possible, and we know it's possible. Some say, well, you can't always have a hundredfold harvest. Well, Jesus didn't know that. Because Jesus said the one who got a hundredfold harvest is the one who, who prepared the ground, and when the seed came, he received it with thanksgiving. He received it. And he had, and he had a hundredfold harvest. Well, that, that potentially is my heart could be prepared, in this case, to be here tonight. It's, it's, uh, uh, I, I know Sunday, we, uh, I mean, th those who study communication and teaching and such as that, uh, when I went to Bible school, you, 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 get, you, you get some classes in that, and I was kind of paying attention, but I wasn't ever going to be doing any public speaking anyway, so I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention. But I had a, I had a class in communication, but, but since, like I said, I, I knew I was never going to be in the ministry preaching like this, you know, there's no need trying to get an A-plus in that class. But, the, uh, the, you know, you can put into practice all type of skills. In other words, you're supposed to move around just a little bit, and then you're supposed to go like this just a little bit, and then you're supposed to move your hands like this a little bit, and then you're supposed to do your voice inflection just a little bit, you know, up and down and back and forth. Because if you, when pe you're moving, people, it, it helps keeps them alert. But, if, you know, if you just say, the Bible said, well, you, you're going to lose a few people. And, or it needs to be a two-minute sermon. So at most, they say that we receive about 10%. Of, we retain about 10% of what we actually hear. You increase that a little bit more when you're physically in a room with someone who's speaking because you're employing sight and sound. And then if you've got a, th a few theatrics, you know, like side straddle hop, <laughs> then you may get a little bit more. But, uh, but you don't want the side straddle hop to be the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the sermon. So... As we, uh, as we begin to increase in these things, and then we filter out the other things, then we get what we truly desire. So God wired your thoughts to have power. So that you would be equipped to overcome every obstacle. God sets you up for success. No doubt. When you get to heaven, there's, there's, you, you, there's no way you're going to go to the throne room and going to win this one. Certainly we would have enough sense not to do that that you didn't give me a fair shake, God. I wouldn't be standing around. I don't know if there's any trap doors in heaven, but if I was going to say it, I'd, I'd look around real good, you know. You know. So, no, he didn't, he equipped all, all of us to overcome. Uh, Lexi was, was reading the scripture right before church. She's up at the house for a minute, and she was reading Joshua chapter 1. And, of course, I was telling her, so you, when you think about that particular chapter, Joshua chapter 1, the, the, the weight of it is this, that, and I know y'all familiar with it about Joshua chapter one, where he, he says he says put the word in your eyes and your ears day and night don't don't let it depart from you. In other words, when you meditate on the, on this word, he said you you will you you Joshua you will make your way prosperous. Joshua you will have success. In other words, success is dependent on who, him or God, well himself by him putting in the the word in his mouth and in his heart. Now I, I don't know. I, I, I just I, I was thinking about if, if you're if you're in a field of shoes of a man who was running two and a half million people every day, and they just took one page to tell you how to do it. I mean, you would have thought the the book that they would have handed Joshua to successfully lead two and a half million people would be bigger than the Bible itself. But it just it really was just instructions on one chapter. That's 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 pretty powerful, isn't it? And, and, and the whole chapter is not even necessary. I mean, it wasn't even needed knowledge because in, in, the, in the beginning of the chapter, it starts off and says, oh, by the way, Moses is dead. Well, Joshua knew that already, so that he, didn't, he, he didn't need that too much. It said they mourned for Moses 30 days. I don't know why. They always complaining to him all the time. I mean, I, mean I, I don't know why they cared after he died. But, you know, they got to cry about something, got to complain about something, I guess. And so... Uh, so Joshua is the successor of Moses. Man, think about it. How would you like to step into his shoes? And he's gone and says, okay, here's your bunch, two and a half million of them. Okay, we want some more water out of the rock. <laughs> I mean, well, the food's still going to fall down, you know, from, from the sky? Well, Joshua chapter 1 covered everything. What you're going to do with your eyes and with your ears, what you're going to do with your mouth. He said, if you can handle those things, he said, you'll have a successful life from here on out. This is probably, to be honest with you, no matter what you teach on, we can teach on in Christ, we can teach on identification and all that's, you know, mastery. But if you don't master this, it won't matter what else you teach. 
This is, this is the crux of, of Christianity. Because you can't even get born again without what I'm talking about. You have to accept God's thoughts and believe them and speak them out or you can't even get saved. But when you master these, these principles right here, I don't care if you went to the third grade and you, and you can't spell the word stop or go. It would help, but you still can succeed. So the, it, it, the, 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 these are not just basics. They're basics on one end, but it's, but it's it, 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 on, the, on the highest end. You know, whatever the highest of, of all math is, I don't know what it, you know, what's, what's the highest of all math. It's not algebra, I know that. It's not trigonometry, it's not calculus, or is it, or whatever, whatever it is. It's, it's, it's the most basic math, two plus one is three, and, and then, then, and I won't give you anything on trigonometry. But anyway, it masters all of it. So when you, when you get the sum total of, of everything that God's saying right here, at the, at the end of the day, he's saying, what are you going to believe? What are you going to do with your mind? What are you, what are you going to do about your thinking? Then are you gonna, what are you going to do with your words? Because faith has to be released in words. What we're doing when we're actually giving is we're, is we're, we're engaging in a spiritual law right, of sowing and reaping. But the exchange... But really what makes it work, and I, and I hope you know this by now, but the only thing that really makes that work is not that you're giving, because God doesn't really need your money. We spend it around here all the time. I, I, I find out Alabama, uh, we have pen pals. Y'all have pen pals at home, like the power company, the water bill, <laughs> write you all the time? Yeah, so and they do, and they can just go up and down in prices or whatever. I think we had, we had a, a high water bill the other day, and it was like two and a half times what it should be. It turned out just one, one commode hung for three or four days, running day and night for three or four days. Amen. So we'll be receiving a special offering for that $80 tonight. <laughs> That's good. Now, but anyway, the, 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 point, the point of the thing is, is that, is that when, we, when we put the basics and we put it into life that you no longer think about it, but that you just think this way. In other words, you don't think, what should I say? You just say because you've already renewed your mind to it, and then you just you just say. Can you, can you remember back when you got begin, first began to get teaching on the power of, of words for the first time? I mean, I mean, uh, I went to church all my life as, as as a kid and a teenager, and I I can't say that they didn't teach on it. Maybe you can, Barbara, I, but I, I don't remember one sermon. Do you? In a full gospel church. So it, it wasn't until later on, you know, in my late 20s, when we, when, uh, when we went to a, a little word church, and then I thought, there's no way he's reading from the Bible up there. There's just no way. I mean, I would have heard this before now. I mean, my mother made uh, three times a week, right? We'd have, we'd have heard this somewhere. I never heard it anywhere. Now, it could have happened, but, but, but she'd remember. I'd remember. Nothing on the subject about the power of spoken word. And, and, uh, but I, I can't say that I definitely, you know, you know got 100 on, on the great, but that's one of the things I picked up on the fastest and the quickest of anything that I learned about faith because it was so shocking to me that, to think that, that words really have that kind of power. Now, I, I'd always heard, and this is not right, but how many of you ever heard growing up, sticks and stones may break, may break my bones, but words what? Well, you know, that's a lie. I mean, the devil had someone come up with a rhyme to teach you that words won't have no power. And they taught you as a kid, <laughs> words hurt you. No, they won't hurt you. They'll kill you, man. Or they'll, or they'll bless you or they'll kill you. <laughs> There's no middle ground in there. Words won't hurt you. Really? <laughs> You've never read Proverbs. It says death and life is in the power of your tongues. <laughs> like words won't hurt you. Amen. Even the policeman will tell you that. He says, now you have a right to, to be quiet. He said, but whatever you say, he said, we're going to use. <laughs> if you speak it, we're going to use it for you or against you. So you can be quiet. You should be quiet. And see what you just did? You ought to be quiet. <laughs> but if you don't, we're going to tell it, and you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Well, even the policeman tells you that. So, the, so a lot of times, the best thing to say is nothing. It really is. Sometimes the best way is to say nothing. 
You can have a happy marriage life sometimes if you just won't say anything. <laughs> now, there's times that you do need to speak. But sometimes the best thing to say in life, you don't married or unmarried, is just don't say anything. Huh? Now, I didn't know that my first few years of when I was married, so I did speak when I should have been quiet. And sometimes I was quiet when I should have spoken. <clears throat> But, you know, I've learned a little bit in 39 years, not a whole lot. She still teaches me, and, you know, I'm, I'm still going to school. But, I mean, sometimes the best thing to say is nothing. And when you're dealing with some things in life, and you're dealing with some things, you know, whether it's your relationships or your marriage or your home or your finances, whatever it is, you've already spoken. And the enemy comes to set you a different way, and sometimes you don't need to say anything else. Sometimes you just let what you have said Keep on. In other words, the last word spoken is doing the commanding. You need to you, you need to let the, what was said last keep standing. And you don't have to you, you, you don't have to say, well, he, he comes this way, so all of a sudden you think you have to do something. No, it, 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 the answer to him is still no. All the promises of God is what is yes and amen, which means all the promises for him to stop it is no. No stopping here. So we're going to go forward. If we're going to go forward then we have to fill our mouth with the right things. Create that no-fly zone. Um, now, um, so focus on what you desire. Remember that God wired your thoughts to have power. Remember that uh, you would be equipped to overcome every obstacle. Uh, and number five, he fashioned you to create, he fashioned you to create, innovate, strategize, and succeed. Create, innovate, strategize, and succeed. This works, this works if you're a student in school. This works if you need help on a test. This works even if you're a child. God will work with you on your level. If you're in the third grade and you can understand two scriptures, even with your understanding, God, God is doing powerful things. You're, you, you're the most powerful thing that God has on the planet. Now, you may not feel powerful as a, as a Christian. I'm talking about as a Christian. But you are the most powerful entity that is on this planet. There is nothing any more powerful than you. Now, you may not have the physical strength of a lion or a bear, but still, according to how God made us and through the new birth, he made you in the very image and likeness of God. God calls power, not the physical strength, well, I mean, if you think about Psalms 103, it talks about the angels. It said those who excel in strength, they excel far above our strength. I mean, you wouldn't want to wrestle with an angel. I mean, you wouldn't want to just, you know, slap Michael or Gabriel, you know, and just say, what do you think about that, big boy? Well, he, he might show you. <laughs> Never find you ever again. I don't know. So the, the, they excel in strength. But they're not even created in your class of being. We all been created in the God class. Isn't that awesome? God, God reproduced himself in you. Woo. Reproduced himself in you. You're the new man class. You're the, uh, I'm using E.W. Kenyon, Kenyon terms. I just hadn't thought about that. I, I, I hadn't studied him, but I, just thought, but I read things I ain't never forgot. He called it the Superman class. Huh? Yeah, that's who we are. You've been made in the Superman class. So, so he fashioned and created you to, to create. You can create with your words and your thoughts. Innovate. You can innovate or re-innovate anything. Your life, your home, your marriage, your business, anything. You can actually have a lot of fun with this. I, I've used this, I, I, I've used this a whole lot in, in business through the years. You know, before I was ever in ministry. Of course, I used it all the time in ministry. But, but just think about the, the things that you can actually do as a, uh, you know, whether you're employed or whether you're on a business. You, you, you can create that business to be what it needs to be, what you want it to be. You can innovate it. You can strategize with the Word of God. You, you can absolutely succeed. You don't have to take the best offer. You are the best offer. In other words, you know, <clears throat> my thinking was in business like, I'm not in business. We're in business. God and I are in business. God, how would you run this business? What would you do in this situation? In other words, you, you would get his thoughts and you would get his purpose in it. You, you would just, you know, what a lot of people do is they just, 
they, they go with, God, I'm going to go do this. Come help me. Don't, 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 don't do that. No, he's, <laughs> he's, the, he's Mr. President. You're, you're, you're the vice president. Actually, you're the secretary and treasurer. Holy Ghost is vice president. In other words, let, the, let them speak and you take the minutes at the meeting. But a lot of people do it the other way. You know, they plan and then they make a plan. And there's nothing wrong with making a plan, but then, then they ask God to bless that. No, I mean, find out what God's doing. That's important for you to know. What is God doing right now? Find out what God's doing in this hour, in this time, and get involved with that. Find out what's already blessed and build on that. I know that you know these things, but sometimes we, we, we can just let things slip and we forget. What is it that God's already doing? What is it that he's already done? Look around you and see what God's doing because the whole word belongs to us, but, but, but you could be in a certain season in your life and not even, but if you don't pay attention to the season, you can miss the opportunity. Don't miss the opportunity because you're out of place. Find out what God's doing in your life today and get involved in that because that's already blessed. That's, that's already working in his plan. And you'll, you, you'll find it, it's like flying the kite with the wind instead of trying to fly one with no wind. Well, well if you're going to fly a kite with no wind, you, you, you would just, that's called running. That's called a lot of running, right? If you're going to do that, run downhill. It'll, it'll help a little bit. Then ask someone to come pick you up and to get to the bottom. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be tired even then. But, you know, when you're just sitting there, when you got, you, you got uh, 20, 30 mile an hour winds or, or, or whatever wind speed that you need, you're just sitting there with a string and you're just letting it out. And the wind's doing all the work, right? Well, who created the wind? So you're, you're working with what is. But being out of season is, once again, trying to fly, fly that kite, which the, the, the kite's capable, but it, has, it only needs one really good ingredient, and, and, you know, and other than the person in the string. It just needs some natural wind. So what, what, what is the wind doing right now? What, what, where, is, where is God working in your life right now? You may you say, well, I don't really know. Well, ask him. The Holy Ghost knows. He knows everything. And, he, and he's willing to show you. Sometimes you just have to get quiet. Hmm? The reason why things don't work sometimes for a lot of people, and I can just tell you, well, I can't do that. I'm, I'm going public here. So anyway, uh, it, it, it would help you if I could read something to you, but I can't do it. Uh, anyway, the, he, here's the deal. So find out what God's doing in the, the season of your now life. Because if, if you're not listening, you're not paying attention, you, you are going to miss the moment. Or else you won't get the fullness of what you could get. And you can be quoting all kinds of scriptures and believing all kinds of things, but, but you still have to be at the right time. I mean, you, you don't jump on the elevator, you know, while it's moving. I mean, you, you don't get on the Ferris wheel, you know. I mean, you, you wait till those riders stop and they get out. But if you just try to stand real close to it and, and, and jump and hold on to a bucket while it's going around, you, you might make it, you might not. No, there, there's, there's, a, there's a right time to do things, and there's the wrong time. And God understands all the natural parts of it. There's times he's told me through the years of pastoring, he said, don't do this now. He said, it's just, it's just not, a, it's not the right time to do it. He says, people aren't ready for change like that. And I said, you know, and, 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 and in my youth and my lack of knowledge about the thing, I thought, well, if it's you, if it's your will, I mean, I mean what difference is, what time does it make? Well, it, it does make a difference, doesn't it? In other words, you know, if, if you're going to go to Alaska in January, Poppy, good thing to have some coat and galoshes and, and some sleep, you know, and where it's going to get really cold. But if you go in August, you may not need all that. Certain parts you might need, still need it. Uh, so um, why? Because there's a, there's that season in place. And you can't confess, always confess the season away. Well, I don't like winter. I'm just going to confess it away. Well, I'd like to see you do it. I don't believe in winter. Well, you, you cannot believe in winter if you don't want to, but <laughs> there's still something called winter, right? Well, I don't, I don't believe in sleeping. Well, it, it'd be good if we didn't need to sleep. We'd get more done, I guess. Or more people could watch more gun smoke. I don't know, but I'm just saying, <laughs> but there's still day and night. He says as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest time. It, it's, it's, not up for, it's not up for a vote. There's spiritual laws. Well, I don't believe in, you know, gra uh, you know uh, gravity. Well, you don't, we don't get a vote. 
These are laws. I mean, if you go by the, the, the I mean, the Natural Power has these power plants. If you think that's a playground with monkey bars out there, you could swing for a little bit, <laughs> but you won't swing long. Because everything that God has done, he parallels that with a, with a spiritual and a natural law together. That's why Jesus always, when he was teaching a spiritual principle, remember he was, he was, he was talking to farmers most of the time, or people, you know, who's raising, you know, whether they was raising pigs or whatever they was raising. But he would say, there was a man who went out to sow a field. There was a man who had a son. He went and did this. And, and he would parallel a spiritual principle with a, with a, with a natural uh, an example to teach you a spiritual truth. You, we need the natural and the spiritual. You can't, it's not just spiritual. There, there's, a, there's a natural application to it. And, and you don't want to miss either season. You don't want to miss either opportunity. Like this is the time to do this now, but, but, it may not, but it may not be time in six weeks to do this. In other words, you know, you, you could have Christmas in July, and I, they've been trying that for years. I, I don't know if they're trying to get two Christmas out of the year for the retailers. I, I don't know what they're trying to do. But, you know, the, the, I mean, the Hallmark, don't they still do that? Doesn't Hallmark, when they do Christmas in July, do they start doing Christmas movies again? Wrong, right? Y'all don't know? They do? Who wants to, I mean, if y'all do that, I mean, forgive me for what I'm about to say because I'm going to say it. Who wants to watch Christmas movies in July? Huh? I mean, it's just, what's the, what's the, what is the real purpose of Christmas in July? Did you miss it in December? Or are you, are you missing it because it's gone? I mean, if you are, just, you know, enjoy, I guess. But the Hallmark plot's going to be the same. Just watch the last four minutes, and you'll, I mean, you'll need, I mean, watch the first eight minutes, and you know how it ends. You'll know who he's going to marry. It's going to be the country boy most of the time. It won't be the guy from the city. It'll be the other one, right? Okay, I'm, I'm bailing, so I get off that. So, Jeremiah 31, 33 says, he said, I'll put my instructions deep within them, and I'll write them on their heart. So that means we need to hook up our heart with the ultimate power source. Hook up your heart with the ultimate power source. When facing impossible situations, it's vital to know that you're the believer and God's the performer. Don't ever mix that up. You're the believer and God's the performer. He said, have faith in God. And then when you say this, so-and-so will happen. Well, your job is to believe and your job is to say, and then God does the performance of it. Remind yourself of the mighty things this is a principle that I, I put in place all the time. I, I, I do this once a week, at least somewhere. Sometimes I got to go visit places where I have been, to rem and I'll just remind myself of when I used to be right there, and this is where I was in life there. I used to live right here. I used to do this at this time of life, and I'll go visit those places. And when I go visit those places, it'll take me back to you know certain times when you was dealing with certain things in your life, good and good, and sometimes not so good. It, it, it helps me to, to remind myself of the faithfulness of God. And, 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 I, and I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just go jump in my truck and I'll just go ride sometimes. You know, when, when I need to think like this and say, well, well, it looks like we got a situation. Now I'll ride back over there and say, well, 15 years, I was right there. And it, it didn't even look like there was any way possible. Then I'll, I'll just see what God has done. Sometimes I'll just go by and go look at a building that I bought with zero money. You know, the Lord said, buy it. He says, won't be here long. I said, well, how much? He said, buy a quarter million. You know how much money I had? None. Credit, none. Bank said, well, first thing we're going to need is two, year, <laughs> two years financials. Well, I ain't been in ministry for a year. How am I going to give you two years? I don't even have one year. So n n nothing natural is going to work there. But you know what I did have? I had a word from God. When you have a word from God, it doesn't matter about the natural says. You know, when, when Jesus told Peter, or uh, he said, if that's you, let me come walk on the water. Well, it was Jesus. He said, well, come. It, it, I've always thought it funny because people say, well, Peter saw the winds boisterous, and I mean, you know, and I mean, they were just like, you know, it, it was real stormy, and I thought, so that makes a difference? I mean, he, he could walk on the water if it wasn't? No, I mean, I mean, try it in your bathtub. I mean, if it worked in your bathtub, it'll work in the storm too. 
but Jesus had come. So the, the empowerment to do something is in the directive. So when he directs you to do something, the ability to do it is, is in the directive. So if he tells you, come, the ability to walk that out is, it was in the command. Yeah. What, whatever he tells you you can do, do it because it can be done. Doesn't matter what the doesn't matter what the natural circumstances is. All that'll change. All that'll have to bow its knee. When you begin to walk out on nothing but just look like the raw word of God, with no support around you whatsoever, people or finances or or, or that other situation may be, X-rays, whatever it is. When he says come, just go walk it out. You say, well, I'm, I'm a little skittish. Well, <clears throat> I've done it a lot skittish. Hmm. I've done it with fear and everything. Because, you know, I'm believing God saying this. I'm believing God saying doing that. When, when you walk off your job to start a ministry, and there's, there's no savings, there's nothing guaranteed, and you're going to hand over business, and you, and you can't go back and say, well, that didn't work out, and go back the next week. And Because and I think God said that. I, I, I believe you're saying this. Well, did he or not? I don't believe so. What you going to do? Uh, praise the Lord, saints. Well, I was six months getting late because I was thinking it out. And that's, that was my problem. I was thinking it out. You say, well, what were you doing that for? Well, I'm glad you've never done that. <laughs> Amen. Well, so, I, so it, I mean, I actually went full-time in ministry within one year, self-sustaining ministry. Of course, it didn't take much to sustain my salary at that time. Not much. <laughs> Amen. I accused Michelle one time when we were first married. I was accused her, I was accused her of uh, misappropriating the money and funds. She said, you never give me any to practice on. <laughs> I said, that's hurtful. But I said, what have you done with the money? She said, what money? I said, all the money that, that I'm handing over to you. She said, you, you've been handing over money to me? <laughs> yeah, you misappropriated it. She said, here, here's your $5 back. <laughs> no. So remind yourself of the mighty things he's already done and then put faith in his ability. Here's another one, real simple. God, two things God never said. Oh, oh, or oh, no. God never says, oh, oh, or oh, no. Anyone ever heard of God say, oh, oh, uh oh. No surprise with him, is there? You must connect your beliefs to your speech. Dr. Lillian B. Yeoman said it this way, God has tied himself irrevocably to human cooperation. Whew. Wow. God has tied himself irrevocably to human cooperation in the execution of divine purposes. He has made man's faith a determining factor in the work of redemption. Therefore, human cooperation begins with faith in your heart and is released with words of faith such as I believe. So your, your faith has a voice, and it has to be voice activated. Mark 11, 23, 24, we know that, where Jesus said this is how faith works. He said, for verily I say unto you, whoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. The very next verse says, therefore, what, what things wherever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Well, that 23rd verse, it mentions the word say three times and to believe once. So in other words, there's an emphasis on saying. Most people don't generally miss it in the believing part as much as they do the saying part. You have a lot of believers. Who are they saying that they believe? But primarily, they don't put a voice to what they believe. The devil does not care what you believe as long as you're silent about it. He doesn't care what you believe. You say, well, we're believers. We believe. Well, he doesn't care what you believe. He doesn't care where you go to church. He don't care how many books that you read. He doesn't care how many uh, prog uh, spiritual programs that you watch or how many CDs that you listen to. As long as you don't act upon it and as long as you don't speak it, it makes no difference to him. He doesn't care what you believe as long as you're silent about it. We know Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and what? Hearing by what? 
by the Word of God. That's how faith comes. But see, but now faith has to be released. And how is faith released? Faith is released through the spoken Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. But faith must be released through the spoken Word. If you do not speak out what you believe, faith is not in operation. Can you see why a lot of people, we have a lot of believers, but we, we don't have near as much faith in operation? Because that takes a principled life. It takes a principled life again to speak out. It's Joshua chapter 1. He said, you have, to, you have to see it, you have to look at it, and you have to say it. And if you do, he said, you will make your way successful. If you took any part out of what God told Joshua, the saying part out of it, the meditating part out, the believing it part, and then the speaking part of it out, it would not have worked. He would have failed. He would have made it a month after Moses left. He had to have all three com components, the, the meditation, the, the, the believing, and the speaking. He says, and then you, not me, God, God says, not me, you will make your way prosperous. Why? Because, especially in our covenant, when, when you are here <clears throat> in the absence of Jesus Christ, Jesus is not walking the earth like we are. We are his representatives. So we can't say things and say we're representing him that he does not say. You can't just say what you're feeling and represents Jesus Christ. But if you're saying what he's saying, you are his representative, and he knows it, and you'll know it, and the devil will know it. But if you just start saying things, but it's not in that book, it's not in, it's not in the book, then you are not representing him. I know that sounds strong, or maybe it doesn't sound strong, I don't know. But just speaking is not, is not necessarily representing heaven. Because a lot of times you can speak out of your emotions. You can speak out of hurt. You can speak out of pain. You can speak out of disappointment and discouragement. All those things. We, we all have that come into our life at times. But if you want to have what the Word says we have, then we have to speak the Word when we feel like it and when we don't feel like it. I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about fruit. I'm not giving you things to do. I'm talking about the fruit. You're going to have fruit. It's going to be lasting fruit, and, you, and you're going to, and, and you're going to walk in the goodness of God and the blessing of God. You're going to have to control, control your thought life, and you're going to have to control your words. If you do not control those two things, your life's not going to be in control. It's going to be out of control. You may have good days and bad days. You'll have a roller coaster life, up and down, good days and bad days, but you won't steadily increase and prosper. Uh, uh, pe people, people quit things all the time. They quit life, they quit, they quit marriage, they, they quit church, they, they, they quit all kinds of stuff. Because the going gets tough, or someone hurt my feelings, or, you know, whatever. You know, what was that song? Who was it saying? I don't even know why I would think about this, but is it Barbara Streisand? You don't bring me flowers anymore, was that her? I don't really listen to Barbara Streisand. I know we don't ag I don't agree with her politically on anything. God loves her, and so we love her that way. But I know we, we wouldn't agree on anything, or what's the matter, or what's the meter. But, but you don't bring me flowers anymore. So we're over. We're through. <laughs> I mean, could, couldn't you see it? I mean, some old boy, he just means well, but he just don't know. And he's going to tell this, this young woman that he really likes and he loves her. And he, and he goes and gets flowers. He don't know. And... He wants them to last, so he goes. Gives her, he gets her plastic flowers. I don't know. You, you, you ladies might be okay with that, but I, I wouldn't think that you would. I was like, "Is he plastic?" <laughs> well, I wanted you to have them a long time. <laughs> They'll stay pretty as cheaper on me. <laughs> well, uh, that season I was talking about, you might have missed your jump. I mean, you, 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 you the combination was off. Amen. Well, so it's important that we uh, understand those truths. Now, 1 Peter 3.10 says, He that will love life and see good days. Who wants to see good days? How do you believe the Bible? Man, wouldn't it be awesome if the Bible was true? Wouldn't that be awesome if the, if the Word of God was true? It is, isn't it? Well, listen to this if it's true. He, that, he or she that will love life, and if they want to see good days, let them refrain their tongue from evil and their lip from speaking no guile. Guile means deception or, you know, cunning or uh, insidious words. In other words, he said, if you, if you want to enjoy your life, love your life, you want to have good days, he says, you will have to refrain your tongue from evil. 
Uh, did, did, did that just something that Peter said, and you know, it just it just filled in a line in the book, or, or is that actually spiritual truth? Is that truth? Yes. You know, one of the first things, and we'll are out of time, but we'll pick up here Sunday. But one of the first things the doctor does when he examines you, I guess he still does. This ain't had an examination in a while, but anyway. But but uh, the first one of the first things that they used to do is have you stick out your tongue. They still do that, I guess. How, how many of you weren't the doctor and they tell you to stick out your tongue? I have. <clears throat> and uh, d do you know why they're having you stick out your tongue? They're counting your feelings. No, it's kidding. No, no. <laughs> See if you have any feelings. Like, oh my gosh, you don't brush your teeth very often. Marge, he's got four teeth left. But anyway, no, so the, the, there's, this is not the only way to say this, and please excuse me for chopping this thing up to a mess if you're medical. But the coloration of your tongue tells them a whole lot. You can just Google up and just say a healthy tongue and unhealthy tongue and, 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 and just look it all up. And I mean, I mean, you can have taste, even your taste buds, it's just some, some of them can't see in there and some of them just like sand it off. They're gone. I mean, you can have white splotches and you can have streaks and you can have a red tongue, a pink tongue, a mostly white tongue, and that tells them everything. Just looking at your tongue tells the doctor all kind of things about how healthy you are or how sickly you are just by the coloration of your tongue. Isn't that amazing? I wonder if there's a spiritual truth to that. Hmm? Now, would you go to God with a problem and he says, I see the problem. It's written all over your tongue. <laughs> hmm? Close with this study right here. And we'll um, talk about it some more later, but we'll close with this. But it says, in recent studies... Leading neurologists discovered that the speech center of your brain exercises dominion over the entire central nervous system. These are credible recent studies. And, uh, and they've known these uh, for years, but they're, they're learning more and more truths that actually just tells us what we already know, that God already knew this, and that the Word of God is truth. And so, um, and then you have, uh, you know, like, scientists like Caroline Leaf who, who you know she, she try uh, you ever watch Caroline Leaf she tries to break it down you know for, for people like me and I'm still like what'd she say <laughs> you know I read the book slow every one read one paragraph I say okay she lost me so it'd take me probably you know a long time to read her book to comprehend it but uh, she's trying to tell you you know in these book in the studies what certain things the brain can do the way that it's wired and can be you know, even if it has damage to the brain, because they thought for years that if your brain had damage to it for whatever reason, accident or otherwise, you know, it, you, you just had to deal with life with what you had left. But that's just not so. That your, your brain can be rewired. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it can be made re, renewed day by day. And so <clears throat> she brings in the spiritual application of that and uh, with the scientific proof to prove it. But anyway, this is not her. Not uh, her. This is, this is in leading, a leading neurologist discovered uh, neurosurgeons discovered that the speech center, which is the far, fr the frontal part of the brain, exercises dominion over the entire central nervous system. They discovered that different parts of the body respond with stimuli to to correspond parts of the human brain. However, when the speech center is stimulated, the entire central nervous system responds. That means when someone says, I am weak and I'm, so, and I'm so tired, or something like that, the speech center sends out the message from the brain to the whole body. It says, prepare to be weak. Now, Caroline Leaf, would, she'd have, you know, she'd have the whole thing set up, you know, and you could see a diagram of the brain and, and the nerves and all what they do. And when, you, and when this happens, then, you know, what happens to the chemicals? And she showed you the whole thing. And it, it, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to watch it if you never watched her. But she says, when you do this, and when you say certain things like this, that the frontal part of the brain from the speech center, it, it taps into all the nerves of the body, which is only trillions in your body. I mean, I know the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, you, you have trillions of miles of nerves in your body. Trillions. That's a lot. And so when you speak words, God's word, words that's not God's word, positive words, negative words, the speech center of the brain 
uh, by and large determines what goes on throughout the nerves in your body so that when you speak these things, actually uh, uh, they're, they're saying that 90% of all sicknesses and diseases is controlled through the speech part of your body. 90% of all sickness and diseases known to mankind is controlled through your speech. That would make you think that 1 Peter 3.10, he that will love life and see good days, let him reframe his tongue from evil and his speak in his lips that they speak no guile. I wonder if God was trying to get over something to us. That when you speak these words, when you speak against yourself, because death and life is in the power of tongue, when you speak death, when you speak decrease, when you speak I'm so tired, I'm, I mean I've had it up to here, and that's it. And, and all these things that, that we release, we, we empower even the natural part of our bodies, which is so supernatural that it works into our, you know, through our brain, it works in our body, it works in the cells of our body, it works down through your organs and into your bones, and it just multiplies uh, multiplied pain or causes, you know, it gives cancer a place to live to start. But the, here's, the, here's the truth. No matter how far you are away, or how far you are down the road from not good, there's no such thing as too late. Now, what, pe what people generally get discouraged with is this, is that they, they don't, sometimes they don't start till they're almost to the end. Well, it's better to start at the beginning, right? It's easier to build a house when the before the storm comes. It's almost impossible to build one when, when the storm's coming. That's why the scripture says, you know, so when, when the storm comes. If it's not built on the foundation, it says the ruin of that house is going to be great. If you build it on the sand, you're not going to have anything. Without the storm, they, the two lives may look the same. May, may, may look absolutely the same. But, but when the storm comes, it's going to reveal what the foundation is. The, ha the foundation, as you know, is, is, it's everything to that house. It may be, it, it, you know, it, it's hidden. You may be frustrated because, you know, the, the builder, the contractor, he's out there peeling around in the dirt for three or four weeks, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm, I want to see something. I want to see where my money's going. You, you better leave him alone if he knows what he's doing. <laughs> or or you, you may see it, but it may, not, it may not hang around after the first storm. Foundation is critical. So the foundation in Genesis 1 is speech and words, thoughts. And the imagination of God's heart. Isn't it funny? Isn't it not funny? But it, but but it, isn't it interesting to think about how just creation itself speaks of the imagination of God's heart, the desire of God's heart to create a world for us to live in came from His desire, His thoughts, His words, the imagination of His heart, and said, "Now go function like me, and you can do what I can do." I don't mean you would be God, but you would function. Ask him on the earth, not that you're going to create universes, but the world that you're going to live in. He said, you framed your world with your words. And our life today is, is really, whether we like it or whether we don't, is the fruit of, the, of what we've already said and what we've already spoken and what we believe. But the thing is, we can change that. We can change that. We're, we're, we're taking natural information sometimes. It's called the flesh. We're taking natural information and we're making decisions that's going to affect the rest of our life with natural information. You can tell me all day long if you want to, but you don't understand because I was raised this way. Or you don't understand. I didn't do that well in school. You don't understand that no one ever gives me a chance. You don't understand my family this. I, I, I do understand. I, I don't think, I, I don't know everyone's situation here, but I know most of y'all. I don't think anyone had a perfect life growing up. I don't know if anyone had a perfect life. You know, all of our parents made some mistakes. Most of us who had kids, we had kids in our 20s. Well, what does a 20-year-old know about themselves? Much less raising a, raising a human being. No, so, so we can't blame it on that. Even if you had a terrible situation, you're here. You're here. You can make choices at this, at, at this place right here. You can, go anywhere, uh, you can go anywhere you want to from this place tonight from right here. Anywhere you want to. It just requires a decision, and, it, and it's going to require a discipline out of you of what you're going to do with your mind and what you're going to do with your mouth. And the pressure comes, when the pressure comes, and it will come. I said when it comes, not if it comes, but when it comes, when the pressure hits your life, you're going to, the, the part, there's a part of you, the natural part of you is going, is going to speak and talk about that. 
and and I've blown it. I've blown it more times than I ever should have, and and I have to repent of it and start over again. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when that pressure hits you, if enough enough pressure hits you strong enough and long enough, it, it's there to make you bend and bow. But if you, but I'm telling you what, if 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 you won't quit, and if you'll keep on speaking the word, it looks like nothing's happening. And I know what I'm talking about. I've spoken to my body many times through the years. I've spoken to myself with hernias. And it, it, it didn't happen in a week. It didn't happen in two weeks. But that's why people quit is because you say, well, when things happen all the time, negative, well, here's the deal. See, we're, we're more highly developed in, in negative things. This world goes in a negative stream. This world is negative, right? The world is. So people are more developed in negative things and negative words and, and ne negative situations. So when you begin to get in the world, and, and, and I'm sorry, in the Word of God, and you begin to, to speak this, it's going to be contrary to everything you've been doing with life. And, and, and I can't tell you, I'm going to tell you, you're, you're probably not going to say, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory, be a $10 million in debt, and the next morning the money's going to be at the doorstep. I don't, it, it could happen. I don't think it probably will happen that way. But you're going to have to get started. And you can develop yourself to a place where you, you, you believe your, your own word because it's God's word. And you can get so highly developed in the speech of, this, of, this, of the word of God that when you speak it, it begin to happen just as fast as the negative things begin to happen because you develop yourself in way of God's, of God's thoughts and God's speech. You, don't, you, you speak as him. You say, well, that, is that scriptural? Of course it's scriptural. He said, whatever you bind... On earth, heaven backs that up. Whatever you lose on earth, heaven backs that up. So there, there, there's somewhere you have to cross the line and decide, am I going to be an ambassador for Christ? Am, am I going to, we didn't get there tonight, but am I going to bridle my tongue? Am I, am I going to put the bridle, the bit in my mouth, like on a horse's mouth? Am I going to control my life? Because James 3 says this, he said, a hundred percent guarantee. If a man will bridle his tongue, he said he can have a perfect life and a perfect body. Use the horse as an analogy and a ship as an analogy. And so these are by little things. We talked about great things, but made out of small things. Well, the rudder on the ship is so small to a ship, and the tongue is one of the smallest members in your body. But they said this, but they're very powerful. And if you can bridle your tongue. He says, you can turn your whole body. There's a, there's a video, if you ever want to go watch it, just go look up uh, on YouTube. Uh, you, you know, Kim Clout, of course, his wife Susan, you know, she has a ministry of horses, and she teaches spiritual principles. And I, and, uh, and I, I could have shown you the video, but it was, it was like 18, 19 minutes tonight. And, sh and she's just showing you spiritual principles, but she's showing you on, on the horse. I mean, it's, it's so interesting uh, if you never watched any of her videos, but she'll teach you a spiritual principle sitting on a horse and i'm thinking you know that horse i weighed here many times over and that, and that she had total control of that horse you know and i was like you know there's just things i i mean i don't know much about horses but she was you know showing it back and up she said yeah but now it's using its head and it's using its shoulders from the front but i'm not gonna let it do it this time now it's gone i'm gonna make it make it use its back you know legs and, and its hips and, uh, but it'll, it'll try to do its head this way when I do it this way, but I'm not going to let it. So then when it knows it can't do it, it'll submit and it'll, it'll do it on its own using none of the front parts. It'll just use the back. And then she uses, you know, the book of James about when you put the bit in the horse's mouth, you do it long enough, you'll train that animal to think a certain way. When that bit touches the mouth, the bit will say, we don't do it this way. And the horse will finally submit and say, that's right, we don't do it that way, we do it this way. And when you put that bit in there long enough, and, and that's the part. No one wants a bit in their mouth. They always want to talk. I don't like that. You see the way she looked at me? They don't like me. We're not going to make it. I never get a raise. Pastor didn't even shake my hand. It, it, see, that's just the soulish realm. That's, that's where death lives. But if you want to live life to see good taste, he, he said, you'll have to refrain your tongue from evil. He called it evil. Not bad, he called it evil. He said, speaking contrary to his word, God said, that's evil. It, it'd be one thing if he just said, bad talk. He said, no, evil. When you, when, when you disagree with me and you speak contrary to what I say, he said, 
It's evil. We ought to pay attention. And I know that, know that y'all are. Well, I bless you in Jesus' name. We thank you for letting you come into our home or however you're listening. And uh, we'll pick up on this again Sunday morning. Amen. God bless.